It used to be year by year, now it's month by month that things are changing. And as a result of that, between things that we carry around in our pockets on a daily basis now, we're bombarded from various sources, phones, TVs, computers at work, all manner of media. We're bombarded with uh, what's going on in the world in terms of celebrities, the best people that seem to exist in, in, in the sports world and in the music world, TV and films. And therefore, on that basis, we're, we're very accustomed to the, to the names of many of them. Um, Tom Cruise and some of the, the great actors and actresses. Um, Diego Costa, for those of you, isn't a drink that you get down in Nuri. He's a, he's a footballer for Chelsea. Take that, Adele, many of the great singers. And these are the people that the media is trying to portray that people should look up to, that they should realise that this is the best that is um, in, in the land and in the country in which we live. And I ask the question very simply, are really these people great role models for, particularly for our young people? Because you don't need to be very long till these people are blown up as being great until we realise that Wayne Rooney is now on his third offence for drink driving. The other year in the middle of the Olympics we had all of the um, the drug scandals that were going on. So all these great people all of a sudden are, are brought down from a very high pedestal that the media puts them upon. And I wonder this evening, and I want to take time this evening to say and to consider what the Bible has to say about people in general. And they're very common verses, they're very well known. I'm not going to um, dazzle you this evening with passages and explanations that you've never heard before. I just want to try and draw together a series of passages and, and, and hopefully help you to understand, particularly first and foremost, how God sees mankind. Away back in the first book of Samuel, chapter 16 and verse 7, when they were looking for a king for the, um, the nation of Israel, we read these words, that man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. You know, when we see these people portrayed in the media, we're looking at them on a very subjective level, on a very face-only level. This verse tells us very simply that God looks at people beyond what they look like. He looks into their hearts and sees them. Isaiah says in chapter 64 that all our righteousness are as filthy rags. That basically means, again in very simple English, that the very best that we can do is just like an oily rag that you would wipe down an engine with if you were doing a job in the garage. And again, that well-known verse in Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Many will remember Elizabeth the other week talking to the, to the children and she had a ruler. And she said that this was an example of the fact that God sets a standard, but not one of us can achieve it. So all of a sudden, the people that are being promoted as the very best within the country at sport and drink, um, sport and, and singing uh, and very, very much TV personalities, then realistically what God's saying is that he sees them exactly for what they are. And on that basis, we can apply that logic this evening to every one of us sitting in this building. That God sees us this evening, yes, maybe sitting here in a white shirt and a smart tie and maybe looking fairly presentable, but God sees deeper than that. And we can't hide anything. Fame, money, popularity mean nothing to God. God sees everything. They count for nothing before a holy God. Maybe this evening that's shocked you. Maybe you, you are driven, you're motivated to become one of these people that are uh, seen as, as important, that you've got skills, you've got talents that you want to develop, and that's really the motivation in life. Maybe on that basis you, you're going to struggle with life because realistically, what is it? The, uh, so, um, in the Old Testament, we realise that it's just vanity, it's just chasing after the wind. You never really get where you want to be. In the same way that God's word is honest about our condition, God's word is also honest 
about the character of God himself. That well-known portion in John 3 and 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Often called the gospel in a nutshell. But it very much clearly displays that God is a God of tremendous love who wants to give an opportunity to individuals to respond to him by accepting the gift of salvation. The, the theme through the songs, if you didn't pick it up, was based on the love of God and that, that last piece, how deep the Father's love really just summed up the love that we see displayed on Calvary's cross. And I want to take time to look in a number of ways at this subject of love uh, this evening. As I say, it won't be in a particularly deep way, but I hope it's in a logical manner that you can follow and that you can understand and that God can use it to speak to us this evening. You know, the English language, and I'm probably the world's worst for this, the English language is, is a very difficult language to speak because so often we have one word with so many meanings. I love chocolate. I love my car. I love my wife. I love my iPhone. Now, I'm sure you could yourself work out, well, which is more important, Glenn? I'll leave you to make the decision. But our language struggles when, it's, when the original text was written. If you go back to it, there is three types of love that is recorded for us in Scripture. There's, there's the love that exists between a husband and a wife. Eros love, a sexual love that exists there. There is agape love that is a sacrificial love, a selfless love. And there is filial love, where you have between um, brotherly love, um, a close friendship or something like that. So the Bible seeks to explain a little bit better than the English language can but we have to read it and try and understand it the best we can. But what I want to say is that love is very much an active word. It's not just something that we write about and we read about. It's a word that can be demonstrated, and when it's demonstrated, the depth of that love is very much evident. And I want to talk about a number of things this evening to do with God's love. I want to start off by saying that God's love is an unconditional love. And what I mean by that is we tend as individuals to love people conditionally. That means with conditions attached. I'm sure many of you can maybe think back many years to, to that first love or that first relationship. And maybe everything was going great and you thought, right, this is it. And then all of a sudden you started to see things in the other person and you maybe were starting to express your love towards that person but all of a sudden they didn't turn out to be the person that you thought they were and that love wasn't displayed back to you and relationships finished because of that so there are conditions attached to it so often we do it hoping and trusting that that love will be displayed back to us Parental love is, to an extent, unconditional. We accept, even though we think our children are the best thing that have ever existed, that there are faults, that there are failures within them. And on occasions, we can be let down by them. But because they're our children, we still love them. And yet, we live in a society now where, to be fair, that may have been true many, many years ago, but so many families don't have the situation where the love towards the children is unconditional. When things start to go badly wrong and the child begins to, to misbehave, then that love is withdrawn from them. So really, the unconditional love that we see from God doesn't exist in any other way because God's love is quite the opposite. God's love is very much given to us 
He demonstrated it, as we've already said, upon Calvary's cross. You know, singing in Emmanuel, we, we struggle on many occasions to find pieces that we can sing, that we, that we really feel the, the, the content of the words and the lyrics that really move us and really affect us. And we've got one at the moment that we're considering. And it's a piece that I, I listen to regularly at lunchtime at work. And these are the lyrics of the opening verse. He knew what I was when he made me. He saw the sinner I'd become. Yet he knew he had grace that could save me. His latest work of art has just begun. As I consider that piece, I'm really bowled over at, at, at really what is being said in that. The fact that, that Jesus was fully aware of the, the sinner that I would become. And yet he still was willing to come down to Calvary's cross for me. He didn't come down for the good people. He came down for us as individual sinners, knowing what we would do, knowing in so many ways that we would reject him through various stages of our life until we came to a point where we would trust him. The hymn writer of old said, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? God's love this evening is an unconditional love. Secondly, God's love is undeserved. We live in a society, again, where we believe that we can receive things because we're good, because we work hard, we so spo show special abilities or talents, and on that basis, somebody will give you something and you'll think, well, that's good, I deserve that. I have, I have proved an ability, I have done something for that individual. We need to be honest with ourselves this evening and even more so with God. Is there anything that we could honestly do that would impress God? That would enable us to feel that we deserve something from God? Because of what we saw at the beginning, those opening verses that I shared, it's fair to say this evening, if we're honest, that we deserve punished because of a sinfulness that exists within us. Sinfulness that we inherited from our parents and our parents and our parents are way back to Adam who was involved in the initial sin and the fall of man. And yet, although we, we say that this evening, people still have an inherent logic within them and a feeling that they can work for God's favour and that they can do enough somehow to impress God so that if a time comes where they stand before God, and God said, you give me a reason as to why I should allow you into heaven. That they, they, that they would have various things that they would feel in themselves would sufficiently impress God for God to turn around and say, okay, enter into heaven. Some people, it's regular church attendance. They still feel that that will get them there. Giving to the church, even reading their Bible every day. And as we know, these are all good things in themselves but they will never get you to a stage where you earn enough merit with God. Even outside the church, we, we know people in the community that, that work within the community, community leaders that do a lot of voluntary work and help, and they're all seeking to do the very best they can. When I was in hospital only a couple of weekends ago, the guy next to me was in there with um, pneumonia. And I got chatting to him, and, and he said he was brought up a Catholic. No, no problem, we, we chatted away on many occasions. And he said, you know, I don't do anybody any harm. I, I just hope in the end that that's going to be good enough, that God will acknowledge the very best that I've done and that I will be, I will be accepted into heaven. It's going to be an awful thing to get to a stage where you stand before God and the only thing that you've got is a loose hope that things that you have done will be acceptable. Because Paul tells us in Ephesians, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. But here's the key, not of works, lest any man should boast. So there's nothing that anybody can do 
so that somebody could be in heaven and look across and say, well, I'm here because of what I did. Everybody that gets to heaven will be there because of what Christ did upon Calvary's cross, not because of anything that they had done. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is the only thing that we can hope for. That is the only thing that we know. We don't deserve anything from God. It is very, very clear and very simple. It's because of his tremendous grace that we have the opportunity to trust in him this evening. That's the second one. The third one, God's love is unequaled. I think it's fair to say this evening that nowhere else in history do we see anywhere a love demonstrated towards mankind as what we see in the Lord Jesus Christ. People turn around and, and, and deny the truth of the Bible, but the history books record the events that have occurred. The Lord Jesus Christ came and, the, and died. Yes, it's fair to say that we, we watch the news reports and, and unfortunately on, on certain occasions when there are maybe disasters around um, cities and various things, we hear sad news of firefighters that have been killed in the line of duty or maybe police officers, maybe even um, we're, we're, we're only too aware of people that, that, that serve within the security forces. And to be honest, these people got up in the morning, went to work and expected that evening to be home and in their bed. They never came, they never went to work, you know, expecting and, and willing to give their life. They were always aware that it could happen as a result of the job that they were in, yes. But they were never... Uh, they never gave it in the same manner as the Lord Jesus Christ. We see in, in Jesus a love that is unequaled. He came to this earth with full knowledge that he would give his life for you and me. He didn't get to a stage where he was born, that he was growing up, and then all of a sudden the Father revealed to him, oh, I've changed the plan as to what will happen. The Lord Jesus Christ was well aware. We read in the Scriptures that heaven was searched and the Lord Jesus Christ was the only one able and willing to come to go to Calvary's cross for each one of us. 1 John 4 and 9 we read, Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Philippians 2 and verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself even and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We sang a lot about the cross this evening. Must have been a horrifying place to be, to see another human being lifted up and nailed to a cross. Even if it was your worst enemy, it must be a horrific thing for any individual to see. And we think of that that scene, we think of the disciples and, and the Lord Jesus' his family. And to realise that he went willingly. You know, I don't believe that he, that, he, that, he, that he ever fought and tried to pull his hands away from that cross. I believe he games himself willingly, knowing that he would give, as he would give himself that he would have the power to take up upon the third day that the, 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 the cross and the grave couldn't hold him, that there was a day coming when he would conquer death and sin. And finally, and maybe this is a strange one, just in closing, God's love will become unavailable. Let me say that again. God's love will become unavailable. There will come a time where God's love and the offer of salvation finishes. We read, um, and we're so often uh, aware in the, the world in which we live, of commerce and commodities, we're, we're so used to going into places uh, um, and lifting things off shelves, and, and everything's got a best before date. There's a day coming when that will be useless. We go into stores around the town, and there are sales on, but the offer ends on a certain date. And if you're not there in time, you will miss that opportunity. For a limited time only. These are all the sales ploys that you, you hear and see. 
last day of the sale. Well, I'm saying to you this evening that there will come a point in time where God's love will become unavailable. And if you haven't trusted him at that stage, it'll be too late. Genesis 6 and 3, we read the, the words, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, as the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the end times. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. I don't know whether you realise, but all of the astronomers were saying that the world was supposed to end yesterday, the 23rd of September, because all these stars were supposed to come into alignment. I was only talking to David Bell the other week, and we both, we both said that the scripture says that no man knoweth the time. It's not just going to be a matter of stars coming into line and, and a time that mankind can, can work out themselves. But there is a day coming, I believe, very soon, where the Lord Jesus Christ will return to take his church home. And what we're saying is, at that stage, salvation will no longer be available. So very simply, God's love this evening is, is displayed in an unconditional manner and is available for each one of us to simply trust in him this evening. It's undeserved. There is no way that we can work for it. We have to simply come and accept that it is by grace that we're saved, through faith, not of works. That it's unequaled. That nowhere in history is anybody else offering salvation. It is only available and Emma covered it this morning with the boys and girls. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And to realise this evening that there will come a point in time where that salvation will be unavailable. There's always a tendency to think, but Glenn, that's years away. There's no guarantee when the Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew 24, no man knoweth the hour. We may not even get to turn the lights off this evening in the building. We could be taken in an instant. The challenge is this evening, are you ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ? I believe that every one of us will meet God on a day to come. Will you meet him as your saviour and, uh, and your Lord? Or will you meet him as your judge? Because if you meet him as your judge, no matter how many ways you try and plead and say that you deserve to get into heaven, Scripture very clearly says that there is only one way into heaven. I hope and pray this evening that just as we've simply considered those things, that it may prompt you to consider them more deeply if you've never made that decision. But equally, if you're sitting there this evening, save that you will once again really just marvel and give thanks to God for what he's done for you and what he's done for many people in this building and to realise that his offer of salvation still exists this evening. If you can turn in your red hymn